about that. I think you covered it. All right. So um, we're really, really fortunate here in the Monadnock region to have Phil Brown, um, who is just an incredible bird watcher and a fabulous educator. And he's the um, site manager of the Pack Monadnock Raptor Observatory, which the Harris Center um, co-runs with the Audubon Society of New Hampshire. And Phil actually wears two hats. Um, tonight he's wearing his Harris Center hat, but he also wears an Audubon hat. <laughs> um, and it's great to have him. He's sort of our link and he's been managing the site and we've been watching hawks there. Is this our 16th year, Phil? This is the 17th year at Pack Monadnock. Wow. Um, and I just can't say enough about Phil as an educator and a birder, I have to say. So if we were in a big room, I'd say, give it up for Phil Brown with an applause. So Phil, take it away. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Susie. And uh, it's been wonderful working with the Harris Center and with you and everybody else who's been such a supportive team. And uh, with that partnership, we've been able to bring this, um, this phenomenal spectacle, really. Uh, some say it's the the greatest spectacle in the in New England in the natural world. We've been able to share this with so many thousands of people right here at our our own Hawk Watch site. But it's happening wherever you live right now. This uh, this migration is occurring across continents. So at any one point, there are uh, raptors flying, probably in your neck of the woods too. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, a little bit about hawk watching, why we do it, uh, what it's all about. Um, and especially, I think a lot of you are finding out um, you want to know more about the natural world during this time where a lot of us have been uh, just staying in a little bit of a, of a smaller home range, uh, more or less, in the past six months. So we're connecting with things in our backyard or our local parks or favorite natural areas. Uh, it's been a great way to connect. So all you have to do with raptors is be able to find a little patch of sky on the right days and um, and you've got the rest uh, of course the fancy optics help but um, that's not included here in this presentation uh, so we're partnering at the hawk watch with the harris center and new hampshire audubon um, and i am going to focus a lot on the pack monadnock hawk watch but a lot of this information can be um, really um, applicable to a lot of areas in the northeast so just a, a few of the questions that I'll be posing to you all tonight. Um, uh, what is our role? Um, where are these raptors going? How are they doing? Um, this image here is a young broad-winged hawk. That was one of our raptor release birds one year. But we'll have to start out by just generalizing. What, what is a raptor? Um, what defines a raptor? Raptors, hawks, um, you know, I use those terms interchangeably along with birds of prey. So there are really three ways to describe this whole group that we're talking about. Uh, and generally the two main features of a raptor are the hooked bill for tearing meat. They are all meat eaters. There are no vegetarian raptors out there, as far as we know. Um, and there are um, killing talons. They all have um, sharp piercing talons for grabbing prey. That's how they, that's how they attack and catch their prey, which ranges uh, everything from the size of um, grasshoppers and small insects to large fish and, and um, even some uh, medium-sized mammals. Uh, so this family of raptors is quite diverse. It includes eagles, ospreys, the kites, the harriers, the true hawks, what we call hawks. There are many different types of hawks and the owls. Um, for this purpose, we'll They'll also include falcons, which are raptors, and vultures, which are not raptors. Vultures don't have one of those key features. They don't have the killing talons. They eat um, carrion, dead animals. Um, but we, were, we will not be talking about owls, really, in this talk. This is the daytime flying, migrating raptors. So there are lots of reasons we do what we do to study them. Um, some of the, um, the best information that we get from raptors, um, as far as their populations, their, their migration patterns, their behaviors, come from these standardized long-term uh, counting locations, hawk watch sites. 
um, some of which have been active for many decades at this point. So studying um, a movement past one particular point over, over years in a consistent way uh, is an excellent way to track changes. Um, we can also track population changes, migration timing, um, and then the impacts on raptors uh, based on weather, topography, just how they move. Um, we do it because we want to protect them. We think they deserve an equal place at the table. That wasn't always the case, though. You can see down at the bottom right, the photo there depicts dead raptors, mostly broad-winged hawks, lined up by the dozens. And that was from Hawk Mountain. These were locations uh, and ridgetops along the Appalachians, especially, where hawks were just shot out of the sky. Uh, it was sport back then. It was also pest control in some people's eyes. Um, a lot of people had, had backyard animals, and there was a perception that all hawks eat chickens. There's still a lot of that perception out there. I hear a lot. Um, some hawks do eat chickens. I can't say they don't, but um, that's, uh, that's not going to decimate your chicken population more than other things. Um, so yeah, conservation purposes is a big purpose. And um, we engage with nature. And it's, it's fun. It's a great way to connect and um, lead um, any aged person into uh, uh, a lifetime of conservation and, and fascination with the natural world. So there are places all over the continent and really all over the world that are monitoring migration sites. And um, there are almost 200 that are actively sending their data now into this large database called hawkcount.org, um, the largest um, uh, database of natural history information in the world is their claim to fame. Uh, so 130 of those happen in the fall. Many of them are in the Northeast, the Great Lakes region. Um, and then to a lesser extent in the Rockies and the West Coast, but really all through um, North America. And um, these sites are reporting their data uh, to a, uh, another organization that Susie mentioned, the Hawk Migration Association of North America. There'll be a talk from Hamana for short uh, next week at some point. But um, there's really a varying degree of how long a lot of these Hawk Watch sites have been reporting their data uh, it really all started with Hawk Mountain, where you saw that photo of all the dead raptors. And uh, 1934 was the year they got going. And um, Hawk Mountain has been um, leading the charge in conserving raptors, um, really starting with um, really protecting, physically protecting the summit from where hawks were being shot out of the sky. That was how it began. And 80 some odd years later, they're still doing it. So we're going to have a, a talk uh, from Hawk Mountain, which will be really exciting also. So a lot of great ways to learn. Um, so one of the tools created by this group of research organizations, including Hawk Mountain and Hamana and others, uh, is called the Raptor Population Index. And this is essentially the best way to gauge uh, North American raptor populations in their entire range, just how big the population is based on uh, their, their detections across um, different Hawk Watch sites that have a certain methodology and a certain longevity of their location. So, um, so they're collecting this data in a very consistent manner. Pacman Adnock in New Hampshire, um, our local Hawk Watch, is one of the 60 locations that has been chosen in this most recent data analysis. And I'll have some teasers about populations and um, the changes that we've seen, but I'm not going to give it all away in this talk. You'll have to watch me again in October, talk about that one. We have a talk in October 13th. But in general, um, you can see um, the range that we have of uh, raptors increasing, decreasing, and stable. So this is overall populations in North America. And you can see that list of decreasing is actually quite alarming, that about seven of the 14 most commonly seen species at our Hawk Watch are actually in some sort of decline. So there's some reason for concern, even though raptors have enjoyed uh, a lot of protection over the last few decades, there are still uh, certain threats that are impacting uh, populations of many of them. So where do we go and find them? 
Um, there are places around the region in New England, uh, quite a few sites in southern New England, Massachusetts and Connecticut especially, but in northern New England where we're based, we have Pacman Adnock in Peterborough, New Hampshire, Carter Hill and Concord, uh, and then a couple of not too far away sites in, in coastal Maine and coastal Massachusetts. Um, generally though, we're looking for places that have common geographic features that help us um, uh, find a spot to orient and find um, these concentration points of raptors. So we call these concentration points leading lines and these are physical barriers such as rid ridge lines, rivers, lake shores, ocean, coastlines. Um, around here in our part of New England, there's a lot of bumpy rolling hills, general just lots of um, rolling topography. But there are a few distinct ridge lines and this Wapak Ridge where Pack is located is 22 miles long and it's north south in orientation. It's going the direction the raptors want to be going in the fall, which is generally to the south down the Appalachians. Um, generally though, you could find hawks flying over a really broad front in our part of the world. Um, you can go to a place with anywhere with a good view. You want to be ideally facing the direction that the raptors are coming from. So you have some time seeing them coming in and um, your own backyard can be one of those places. So just a, a little map of southwestern New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire. This shows different hawk watch locations around the state that have reported some sort of data over the last 10 or 15 years. But right now, Pack is the only, actually Carter Hill as well, are the only two official hawk watch sites right now in 2020. So timing of when to go out looking. Um, in fall, the season starts for us September 1st. However, that's not exactly when some of the hawks start migrating. We've already missed a few in August. But at this point, we have a consistent methodology. We're not going to change it, um, at least not anytime soon. Uh, and we go until mid-November, uh, November 20th, generally. Generally though, mid-September through mid-October is the peak time for the most species and the largest numbers. Um, the migration is best right after a cold front passes in the couple of days following the passage of a cold front. And that's because it puts a, a tailwind, it gives the raptors a tailwind, generally a north or a west wind which helps them get some lift off the ridges. So there's some real dynamics that I, I unfortunately don't have a, an image for here, but if you can picture uh, winds hitting a, a, a ridge line that's oriented northeast to southwest, if a north or a northwest wind hits that ridge, it should ideally give the raptors some lift up into the air and help them get the height they need to find the thermals they need and then to soar down the slope. Um, really providing um, as little effort as they need to in order to get where they're going. Many of these raptors are going several thousand miles. If they had to flap steadily the whole way there, they'd never get there. There'd never be enough energy for them. So um, migration timetables are different for each species, um, depending on the food and conditions. So there is that, that really lengthy period of time where um, where uh, raptors could be migrating through this region. And it's, it's different for each one. We have a, a great migration timing chart uh, available on the Harris Center Pacman Adnock page. Um, you can download a free chart that shows you um, when to expect certain species. Um, but this time of the year, a lot of the smaller birds are starting to move, the sharp shin hawks, the kestrels. Um, birds that eat other small birds are following their food source. They're uh, timing their migration with the abundance of these songbirds that are passing through in large numbers. So there's plenty to eat along the way. Um, other species are timing their migrations with the, uh, the thermals, the warm air currents that are giving them the lift they need. So yeah, thermals, I'm just speaking about thermals here. Um, so migrant raptors are using these warm air pockets. And I, I talked about the ridge lines of mountains. The updrafts are coming uh, in when the winds are blowing from the north and the west. And that gives the, the birds the chance to slope soar. 
to head down slope with the wind more or less at their backs. Um, so high pressure conditions, passing cold fronts, northwest winds, all good things. Also, the wind speed really matters. Days when there's no air movement, like today for much of the day, there just wasn't a lot of bird movement. There was plenty of thermal activity, but there was really nothing to usher the birds in any particular direction. Um, so light winds, though, are really good, especially if they're facing the right direction. And then another tip that a lot of people scratch their heads at here is listening to the alarm calls of songbirds. Just as I was leaving the hawk watch today, I heard a warning call of a chickadee. And it made me look up because chickadees happen to give warning calls quite a bit when raptors are around. And sure enough, there were four raptors right overhead playing with each other in the air. So uh, always a good clue at a hawk watch to find a, a friendly chickadee and um, listen to what it has to say. Um, resources, I'll have the page for resources on the last page, but hawkcount.org has daily reports submitted by a lot of hawk watches and including Pacman Adnock, and then next day's predictions are usually included. So what's it going to be like? Should I bother driving up tomorrow? Um, you know, go to that site and find out. So here's what it looks like at our local Hawk Watch site. There's a beautiful view. We're up at 2,290 feet in the Monadnock region. Southwest New Hampshire, um, Harris Center and Audubon are the, the partners, Park, um, the New Hampshire Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, Division of Parks and Recreation. And, um, and on a normal year, there would be a group of people up there uh, enjoying camaraderie and enjoying maybe uh, a milestone like the site and state record uh, that was set that day in 2015. Happy group of hawk watchers dressed a little differently from how we were dressed today, that's for sure. Um, and in a, on a normal year, we'll have a raptor release event that the public can come up and see, and you know, kids can get right up front and watch a rehabilitated raptor uh, get set free, maybe for the first time since it took a spill from its nest or crashed into a window. Um, so that is what it looks like when it happens. It's an exciting moment with hundreds of people However, this is the year we're dealing with, and um, everybody knows the drill, so we're spaced out, socially distanced. Um, we have created this little box set up in order to protect our staff and volunteers and our visitors, keeping people in separate areas. And so far, it's working out really well, so people are very respectful. Um, masks are always on hand for um, our staff and volunteers, so um, you know, that's... Uh, that's that's basically what you're going to see. So very few people up on the platform itself. But in order to keep collecting solid data, we need to have a few eyes at some of the peak times, especially. So we have um, lots of volunteers who are associated with the Hawkwatch site in helping us count the birds and helping do the outreach to the public. And they've been great. And this year is no exception so far. So we have had some some big numbers of visitors on weekends, but still less than in most years. So I think, um, you know, that's going to be the norm this year. Uh, we're not going to be reaching out to, uh, to groups in person this year. That's a big change. So the Harris Center has typically reached hundreds and hundreds of students through local schools who have organized field trips. This year, we don't have any school groups coming up. So i um, we're finding new ways to connect. So, you know, a couple of hundred people watching this, for example, is one of those. So let's get into the numbers and the hawks now. Here's a, a nice big pie here showing uh, the composition of what it is we are seeing and counting uh, as far as hawks go. Broad-winged hawks make up three quarters of our total count. And they're all gonna be coming through in the next couple of weeks. So it's pretty exciting that we're gonna have thousands and thousands of hawks coming through. Sharp-shinned hawk is the next most common. And then the remainder is uh, a mix of 12 or 13 species that comprise about 13% of our pie. And then I'll let you take a look at the, uh, the mean counts for the species that we do see on the left in the middle column. And last year's count showing any um, exceptions and 
abnormalities from the norm. So you can see in bold on the mean count column, Rodman Cox, Sharp Shen Cox in the thousands, several others we see a few hundred of, and then we have some that are just individuals. Um, so last year, typical mix, a lot of um, average numbers, a few high counts and a few low counts. And I'll talk more about those in October. So, so let's get hawk watching. There they are. There's a, what's this? We know this one, right? I think everybody knows this one. This is the bald eagle, of course. Needs no introduction, but how many of you would know this is a bald eagle? Um, a little bit different at that distance. And that actually can be close for some of the birds that we've been seeing. So today we watched a bald eagle for about 20 minutes and um, couldn't tell it was a bald eagle for the first 10 minutes. So basically, I'll be giving you some tips about how to identify these little specks, and um, I'll get into the meat of that now. But four general rules uh, that I like to teach are pay attention to the bird's overall size and shape, if there's any possibility of assessing its size in the air. Sometimes there's another bird that it's with, like a crow or a raven, and those rare chances are, are important to take those and uh, use existing knowledge that you have. Watch the bird's behavior, a very um, underrated field mark that I think a lot of the experts really do hone in on more than anything else, um, and certainly in hawk watching. Uh, coloration and pattern can tell a lot. However, there are some challenges there. And is the bird moving by itself, or is it in a small group, or maybe just a few birds? That can tell you something, too. So basically, if you can get that distant eagle down in your binoculars down to one of these four categories, you're doing all right. So um, uh, of course, look, just looking at a photograph, there's really no uh, depth to it. You can't, you can't see much from that. But we're trying to separate the birds that we see initially in, their, in our heads and out loud sometimes into a family in order to get down to a species identification. So we have the eagles, the buteos, which are the shorter um, smaller than eagles anyway, shorter tailed and long round winged raptors, occipiters, which have long tails and short round wings, falcons, they have angled wings and long pointy tails. And then there are a few others. So, um, so what did I say? Size, overall size and shape. Yeah, so um, we have two birds in this image here. So if you knew what one of them was, you can kind of get an idea about the other one and then go back to your resources your field guide to see oh this bird is half the size it has a, a wingspan of less than half of this red-tailed hawk so on the right we do have a red-tailed hawk without its red tail just because there are a lot of exceptions in the hawk identification world uh, when they're young they have no red tails in that first year of life so that can add some confusion and the bird on the left considerably smaller but still a hawk and um, if you saw it in moving around, you might be able to make more of a, um, uh, get more of a shape out of it. But that is a small sharp shinned hawk. And it's really, there are only a couple of birds that would look that small next to the red tailed hawk. So that's what I mean by size and shape. Um, plumage and coloration, details like that. How many of you would guess these two pictured here are the exact same species? Show of hands. I guess I can't see everybody's hands, but um, it's different not being in a classroom. So yes, um, I mentioned the adults being different. So on the left, we have an adult red-shouldered hawk showing the red coloration in the underwings closest to the body and a strongly banded black and white tail. On the right, we have a young red-shouldered hawk, um, di different features. This is also a good chance to review a couple of those differences because we tend to see quite a mix of young birds that were just born this summer, quite a few because there are two, sometimes three or four that have survived in a nest. So there are probably more young birds than surviving adults in many cases. Um, so we're seeing equal numbers, but sometimes at different times of the year. So young birds in general, juvenile birds, will have streaking from head to vent. So those long brown streaks on the bird on the right. And that compares to um, adult birds, which generally have banding going across the chest, which you can see 
kind of in the belly of that left bird, the red-shouldered hawk. Also, the contrast of the tail and the wings is different in adults, um, especially the budios. And um, the coloration, the features that the bird is named for, it's in its adult plumage. And if you saw the top side of the red-shouldered hawk, it would really be a nice um, uh, ruddy red color. The wings are also a little bit longer in young birds, um, maybe as a, a way to give them an extra advantage in that first year of life. Their, their wing feathers, especially out in the middle part, the wrist of the bird, are... Um, are you able to see my mouse? By the way? Yes. OK, great. So yeah, so this is the wrist of the bird. This bone here indicates the wrist. And um, so the wrist feathers are exceptionally long in the young ones. And that can change the overall shape of the bird. So lots of confusion and exceptions. Um, then we have um, you know, other things that you might know. Behavior. If you watched a bird like this, you might know that this bird is jet black and not a hawk at all. So I threw in threw it in as a little bit of a trick. This is a common raven, which we see plenty of up at Pacman Adnock with its round tail and long projecting head. Um, if you watch a raven a lot, they look a lot like many of the hawks that we see. And they're about the most common thing we see in the sky at the Hawk Watch. So really learning behaviors can be the only way to tell um, that this is not a raptor too sometimes. So ravens will do these barrel rolls in the air. They're very playful, chase each other a lot, and they're often doing their croaking call. So uh, that's a good clue. So behavior is very important. And are they single or are they in groups? So if you see this many hawks together in one sky and they're not turkey vultures, and you're anywhere in the east, they're bound to be um, in fall uh, broadwing hawks. So we're going to see this in the next week or so. This is a typical pretty good day. Uh, so we'll get out to a mountain and, and check it out. So Budios, we'll jump into the hawks now. Um, Budios are the medium to large sized hawks. They're the typical hawks that most people think of as hawks um, because red tailed hawks are very common. And I think a lot of people associate red tailed hawks with that's, that's a hawk. Um, generally, though, they're chunky birds. They have broad wings and broad tails. Um, and, um, and as Pete Dunn, a, a famous hawk watcher and birder, coined the term wind masters, these Budios are the wind masters because they rely so heavily on thermals to give, give them lift more than any other group of birds. So this again is a young red-tailed hawk showing its, its most distinctive feature if you don't see the adult tail. It has a belly band. It has a dark uh, brownish series of streaks that goes right across the middle of the bird. So that's an important field mark. It also has dark leading edges of the wing. But uh, there it is. You know that bird. No mistaking an adult red tail. They, they usually also fly with their wingtips a little bit up at the tips. So let's see um, how those primary feathers are sticking out a little bit. And um, so I've prepared graphs for each species, and I'm not going to get into the details of it. This is an older graph anyway. But it shows the timing of distribution. So um, September is blue, October is red. November is green, and this is you know, really strictly for the birds seen at Pac Manadnock, so it's northern New England biased. Um, so generally red-tailed hawks, it's a bird of October and November is what you'd be able to extrapolate from, from this graph here. And I won't talk about um, trends right now because this, these are old numbers. There's that red-shouldered hawk again. Red-shouldered hawks have a distinctive way of holding their wings. Um, compared to the red-tailed hawk, the wings are arched forward, uh, pointed uh, in the direction that the birds are flying. So that's noticeable even at a distance, um, uh, not in all birds, but in, in many of them. And that's a really good clue. Um, they also will hold their wings up at a slight dihedral, um, and, and but there's also a little bit of a droop to the wings. So. Um, so a little bit of a different shape. They're, uh, they're quite a bit flappier than red-tailed hawks, but otherwise very similar in size and shape. So this can be a tricky bird in October. 
Um, comparing these to red-tailed hawks at a distance um, can be challenging, but we watch for the faster wing beats, the, um, the wing shape, how it's holding its wings. Those are the key field marks because a lot of the time you just won't see the color where you're watching hawks. So they, they fly in October and November. And then the star of the show, the broad-winged hawk. This picture here is an adult broad-winged hawk. Um, their tail banding is really noticeable. Um, you may have noticed on the red-shouldered hawk, there were also tail bands. Um, jump back to that. Um, but fewer in the broad-winged hawk and fewer and thicker. So you can see just a couple of very prominent white and black bands. Uh, the adults also show this uh, dark trailing edge of the wing, the back edge of the wing. It's kind of a chocolatey brown, and the wingtips have that as well. Um, they're shorter wings than both of the other Budios, so they're maybe average about three to three and a half foot wingspan compared to, say, a four foot wingspan of a red-tailed hawk. Again, it's, it's hard to tell unless you have a tape measure out in the sky, which we don't have. So, um, so really comparing them relative to other birds is a good way to get an idea of the size, but with experience, you can get a sense of how long a bird's wings are just by f watching it fly uh, individually. And this is what a young broad-winged hawk looks like. Unfortunately, like Susie mentioned in the in the intro, is that um, there were uh, a lot of broad-winged hawks, young ones especially, getting hit by cars this time of the year. Um, they're out of the nests for about a month now. They're they're finding their own food. They're finally having to feed for themselves not being fed by the parents and they're taking risks and, and just not aware of the dangers so unfortunately this is a really challenging time of year for young raptors from here on really their first year of life is is very challenging overall they have a long migration ahead of them out to south america um, so uh, the other two species of budios by the way i should have mentioned red-tailed and red-shouldered hawk they're not going nearly as far they're going to um maybe the mid-Atlantic states, uh, a little bit beyond that, maybe only a couple of hundred miles in the case of the red-tailed hawk, which does winter in this area. But broad-winged hawks, the entire population vacates their entire breeding range, which is northern, um, most of the northern U.S. and Canada. And that's called a complete migrant, where the entire population shifts to a new wintering range. And they'll go as far as um, Central uh, and South America. So a lot of these these young ones will be flying with the adults pretty soon. Um, and a, a shape detail here for the broad wings, broad wing talk, it does have these really long wing feathers. And the wing tips also come to a, a pretty prominent point, more so than the other two. Um, we call that the candle flame appearance. It looks like a a candle burning uh, because it's long and tapered. Broadwing hawks, purely a bird of September and rarely the first week of October. So all of them are moving out in huge numbers. We've seen over 16,000 in one great season. So yeah, just um, on a really amazing day, you can see just a whole pile of them. And It'll say start new share. Oh, there it is. It just popped up. It just popped up. Okay. All right, so just a very quick clip here showing uh, Broadway talks. See, uh, past that and towards us. Oh my God, this is huge. This is amazing. Oh, I'm looking at one overhead. There's well over a thousand just overhead. I'll take a look in a sec. Okay. Oops. There we go. All right, so that's just a taste of what you could see. At, um, at any uh, well-known hawk watch in the Northeast in the next week or two. And um, there, there will be a day with many hundreds to maybe low thousands in the next couple of weeks. It happens every year. So um, I really find a, a hilltop. We're, we're, this year we're trying to find some new places to promote because we are trying to uh, avoid uh, crowding any locations. So um, find a, a ridge line or just a hilltop with a nice view to the north and you might have the same luck. Um, every once in a while we see a, a rare beauty o slip in, uh, sometimes with the broad-winged hawks like the bird below, which is um, one of the two Swainson's hawks that has been recorded at PAC over the years, uh, taken by 
one of our, our fine photographers, Andre, uh, our volunteer who, uh, who captured this rarity, one of only two or three state records in New Hampshire. Um, so you can see the mix in with broadwing hawks. And then rough leg hawks, uh, a top right bird, happens a little bit later in the season, usually October or November. But these are uh, birds from the west and the north. So on to the occipiters. These are the, the smaller backyard hawks, I like to say, the ones that take your, um, your birds at bird feeders a lot of the time. So they have small to medium sized wings. They're generally smaller birds. They have uh, short round wings and long narrow tails. And for them, it looks like it's really hard work to get where they're going. They're flapping heavily a lot of the time. This is a, uh, an adult sharp shinned hawk. Um, has a you know, long tail, um, short rounded wings, everything typical of that group. This is the young one. So you can see how different the plumage can be. These, um, these nicely colored uh, banded birds that you are in adult plumage and then the young ones are more or less brown and streaky. Um, the adults will also have a nice bluish coloration on their back. So no doubt if you feed birds, at some point you've had uh, your bird feeders attacked by one of these two. Um, the sharp shinned hawk, one of the aggressors at any hawk watching spot. Uh, spot. Um, they tend to go after the bigger things in the air. So uh, we saw that quite a bit today. Um, they're the second most common bird that we see at the Hawk Watch, and they fly mostly in September and October, pretty even numbers throughout the years, too. So, um, so you should see some if you come out on a good day. And Cooper's Hawks, uh, less common overall, but their range is more southerly overall, so we're seeing only a sliver of what comes through. These birds, the Cooper's Hawk has adapted really well with people. Um, it feeds on in backyard areas and urban areas. They go after pigeons. Um, they frequent farmland. They're bigger than sharp shinned hawks overall, although there is an overlap because female hawks are bigger than the males. Um, so there's always going to be a little bit of overlap in species because of that. Generally, though, the Cooper's hawk's head projects further in front of its leading wings, the leading edge of its wings. And the wings are longer and straighter, and the tail is sometimes noticeably longer uh, in proportion to its body than, uh, than the sharp shinned hawk. But these two, it takes a lot of work to figure out occipiter identification. And, um, and this shows you on the left the Cooper's hawk, on the right the sharp shinned hawk, very similar in size. The, the tail roundedness can be one field mark, but the behavior, again, one the behavior is a great way to tell these apart. And the best way to show you that is through a quick video here uh, from Hawks on the Wing. Um, so this video cur courtesy of Hawks on the Wing, which has um, uh, is a great way to learn Raptor IDs. A one minute clip. The sharp shin versus Cooper's comparison represents one of the most difficult pairings, but there are clues that help distinguish the two. Notice the Cooper's hawk on the right has a longer, bulkier tail that also feels more round. Don't forget, however, the round versus square tail doesn't always hold true. Also notice the Sharpie on the left shows a smaller head that is tucked back closer to the body, where the Coop's head projects forward. While soaring, Sharpies will flap more often because they are less stable, where the Coop holds steady. Also look as the sharp shinned hawk is making tighter circles. The bird is actually starting to get ahead of the coop. Comparing the wing flap is easier when side by side. Notice the Cooper's Hawk has a slightly slower wing beat, but more importantly it's using more of the entire wing, whereas the Sharpie is quicker, snappier, and flaps more from the wrist outward. Check out this Sharpie displaying its tendency to flap more often, where the coop is gliding longer between flaps. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so there, you know, a lot of people ask about resources and, and ways of learning. And, and I did want to put in a plug for, for this because, you know, you're usually looking at field guides or field card and having the action, having behavior in a film can be a great way to learn. So this will be on the, uh, the resources later on. Uh, so Cooper's Hawks, um, 
generally outnumbered about six or seven to one by sharp shin hawks. So if you were a betting person and you go up and say, oh, that's a, that's a sharp shin hawk, then you'd be right, right most of the time, but that's not the way to do it. Uh, and this is the last of the excipiters, the biggest one, and perhaps the most exciting to many because of its scarcity, the Northern goshawk, which has been given the name uh, the flying stovepipe because of its stout bodied appearance and uh, extension of the tail that kind of looks like it's part of its body. Um, it's, a, it's a larger raptor, closer to the size of a, of a red-shouldered hawk, so three and a half, almost four foot wingspan. Massive bird of the north that um, uh, seems to be a little more cyclical in its, in its eruptions, and every once in a while we'll see a few dozen of these come by later in the season. Uh, however, however, it's been a while since we've had those numbers at PAC. So we think that goshawks may be shifting their range or declining to some extent. Um, always an exciting bird to see, though. And uh, maybe you'll get to see one in late October or November. And on to the falcons. Um, everybody, a lot of people know this bird here as a peregrine falcon. Uh, it's an exciting raptor that has gotten a lot of attention in many forums, and um, they have strong uh, facial markings. Falcons mostly do have facial markings on their head uh, that you'll, you'll see some darker lines. Uh, the peregrine looks like it's it's a it's a warrior ready to go to battle. It has this um, this helmet on. Um, so falcons in general, though, with long angled wings, they bend at the wrist very sharply. And they come to a, a, a very tapered point. The tails are generally long and pointy, sometimes uh, fanned out because birds can move their tails. They, um, they, they do a lot of that because of how the winds are moving them. They're strong flyers and they're built for both speed and stamina. And they can be going pretty far in some cases. This is a young peregrine. Um, peregrines have been increasing and we should start seeing them in better numbers in the later half of September. Merlin is the lesser known of the, perhaps of the three falcons around here, but um, getting to be more known because of its, its expansion of range. They're nesting now in more areas. They're becoming more common at the Hawk Watch, and they have a personality that is, is really worth knowing. These are feisty little raptors. Um, they go after everything bigger and smaller than them. We'll see them uh, harassing a raven in the air and then suddenly shifting their attention to an eagle and then diving out, catching a dragonfly or uh, harassing a butterfly or a songbird. So it's like nonstop action when you see a merlin. They're never just really doing nothing in the air. They're, they're moving. And that's one of their best field marks, that behavior. Plus, they're very dark birds overall very heavily streaked, um, and, um, and and we see them nice and close and low. There's a decoy owl at the hawk watch that we put up, and that brings the merlins right in. So uh, that's always a fun treat. And then the, maybe the most beautiful of the falcons is the American kestrel. The male has bluish-gray wings, um, reddish back. Females lack the blue. Um, so a lot of nice contrasting features on a kestrel. And it's a bird of the open country. Um, it's uh, not as much of a long distance migrant as the other falcons can be. Um, and it has more of a personality of a butterfly, whereas the Merlin is more like a dragonfly. So the intensity of a uh, Merlin is unmatched. And the Kestrel is usually a little bit more of a lollygagger while flying. Um, they're also very pale bellied. So contrasting to the, the Merlin, which is very dark and streaky. Otherwise they have a very similar shape. Um, however, behavior can be one of their better field marks too in how they flap their wings. And kestrels are a bird of September and early October, generally declining. And um, there's a story behind that in October. Um, ospreys uh, in, in its own family, ospreys, a lot of you may know them from coastal areas, but they're also a bird of the inland lakes and rivers and even power line cuts where they're being pushed to because of, uh, perhaps because of eagle density being what it is now. Bald eagles have become so common that ospreys are being displaced by bald eagles at the favored fishing holes. Eagles are also not purely fish-eating birds. They are more um, 
thieves. They, they go after other birds in pursuit of their own food. So um, osprey is so strictly a fish hawk. That's pretty much all it eats. Um, so they have to migrate to where fish can be found. So they leave by um, late October. And um, generally though, they do look very eagle-like in flight. They also look like a little bit of a gull too. They have an M-shaped wing, a very noticeable bend at the wrist and a really dark wrist patch on both sides. Um, good feature of the osprey though is its big white underside. Um, bald eagles generally won't have, have that big and white and underside. They'll be more mottled. So, um, so if you see a long white uh, belly and long uh, wings and an M shape, just gliding by with a tiny little head, it's probably an osprey. Um, they soar and glide very steadily. They're very strong, powerful flyers too. And they can fly right across the, uh, the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and out over the open Atlantic Ocean for long stretches of time, as we've seen from uh, various maps that, um, that birds with transmitters have, have given back to researchers. So. We have a lot of great information about ospreys and how they move. Many of them are going to Venezuela and Colombia and, um, and kind of island hopping through the Caribbean to get there. Um, some will winter and, and be year round in places like Florida and the southeast. But uh, our birds go far south. Ospreys, though, they are declining. And we'll save that story for another time. Northern Harrier in its own family in North America. There are other harriers in the old world. It's generally a medium-sized bird, but very long and lanky and, and very light in weight. So it has long angular wings and a long tail, and it has characteristics of all three of the groups that we just covered. It flies with a, a um, dihedral, which is the V shape that you can see in the way it's holding its wings right here too. Uh, so much like a turkey vulture. It, um, it, uh, it kind of teeters a little bit too, like a vulture, but they're very strong, powerful flyers with a very mechanical flight. And I, again, I'm going to jump to a quick video clip if I can. Northern Harriers are very long-winged raptors. Their wings look like thin, two-by-four planks of wood attached to their bodies, especially when soaring. Their overall look is quite individualized, however there are times when they can fool you. When soaring, their wings are held straight out from their body, or pushed only slightly forward. They show a very deep dihedral or V, and their tails are extremely long. Their dihedral is as steep or steeper than the turkey vulture, only much thinner winged. In a glide, the harrier's dihedral continues, but it takes on more of a modified look, showing a steeper increase from the body to the wrist, but less rise from wrist to tip. Because the birds are light in weight, they will bounce and tip their wings, also similar to that of turkey vulture behavior. Their wing beat is slow and rhythmic. Their downstroke also goes quite deep, and like many hawks with dihedrals, they end their flaps on an upstroke going into a glide. Their white rump patch is noticeable, even at a distance, but pay more attention to their flight instead, as other raptors can show white rumps in high winds. Just a quick time check, Phil. We've got about five more minutes and yep. plenty of questions. so. Sounds good. That should be perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you can see that some of the technicalities here of identifying raptors. There is uh, so much that goes into just an ID of what it is. But um, but each each of these 15 species has its own characteristics and habits and um, is worthy of, of learning and attention. So um, turn the slide. Here we go. Uh, so this is back to the Harrier, the same species that we just saw, uh, has very strong sexual dimorphism. I'm not, not saying a dirty word here, but I'm teaching you a term about the differences between male and female in coloration. 
So in this, in this way, um, I use that term to refer to different colors between the male and the female. So male uh, harriers are known as the gray ghost, gray ghosts, and they have a, a very different coloration because of that a darker gray color on the back and the head than the brownish streaky females. So um, males, I, I also mentioned, are, are also smaller than the female raptors. So another way that they can be um, dimorphic in, in that way. Uh, but yeah, the gray ghost is seen uh, less commonly and is more of a later migrant that we see at the Hawk Watch in late fall. So, um, so by the time we quit around the end of November, um, there are still plenty of raptors to be going by in that last uh, 10 days of November and probably quite a few gray ghosts. So for a real beautiful bird though, overall, um, they're uh, generally declining as well, but uh, we've seen pretty stable numbers of them. Uh, eagles, let's get to the two eagles here and then the vulture and then we'll wrap it up. So this bird needs no introduction, of course. Generally when we see an eagle flying by, um, we think of a couple of characteristics. This bird is big. Um, and at a distance at a hawk watch, we notice this bird is dark also. Darker than a lot of the hawks that might have lighter undersides because an eagle's wings are generally almost um, a deep brown, almost, almost black in coloration. Um, when it gets closer, you might be able to see that white head and white tail on the adult bird, but it takes them five years to look completely white head, white tail. Uh, in the interim, there are a lot of different phases. There's a lot of plumage variation, such as the bird on the left here in its typical uh, golden eagle plumage. So uh, easy to confuse with golden eagle because of the way the young eagles look at certain times with the uh, banded tail and white feathers. Um, so bald eagles, I think a lot of us have heard the success stories of eagles. They are off of the endangered species list. Um, Many of you are probably seeing eagles a lot more than you used to. They're nesting all over the place. Um, now there are over 70 territorial pairs in New Hampshire, and that number was, was really only in the single digits a couple of decades ago. So it's uh, shot up in, um, almost exponentially. So we'll see what the, the, what the limit is for eagles. They keep on doing well. Uh, however, there, there were quite a few eagle rescues this summer, just incidentally. Um, a lot of young eagles uh, had to be taken in and rehabilitated locally. Um, golden eagle, very exciting bird that is limited in number. Um, this is a classic uh, image of a young golden eagle. They show white at the base of the tail and then a big thick chocolate brown band at the tip. They show white also in the middle part of the wings, whereas the bald eagle uh, young ones will show white kind of throughout the wing. So that's a way to tell them apart. Also, if you get a really great look, like we sometimes do at pack in October or November, you might see the golden hackles, the feathers on the back of the head that give it its name. So there is a um, an adult golden eagle, which is more of an overall brown coloration with still with golden feathers on the head, being pursued here by a red-tailed hawk. Look how small that that what we think of as big red-tailed hawk uh, you know, is next to the golden eagle. So they have about a, a seven foot wingspan or sometimes bigger. Notice the length of the head though on a golden eagle is about half the length of its tail. So that is one key feature. And let's see, I'll, I'll pass up that last video here. Golden eagle, um, we see single digits to low uh, teens of golden eagles at the Hawk Watch. The further west you go, though, the more golden eagles there are. We're drawing from a source population where eagles nest in southeastern Canada. Um, there are really no more eagles nesting south of the border in the eastern U.S. They're extirpated, so regionally extinct. They used to nest on cliff faces in north uh, country and white mountains of New Hampshire, uh, throughout Maine, probably into the Adirondacks. Um, and maybe northern Vermont as well. But now they're limited to north of the border, um, and we'll see if they ever do return. We know there is good cliff habitat where they like to nest. 
And last, and many people think of as least, but the poor turkey vulture, it shouldn't get a bad rap because it, it has an important job as a, an ecosystem service that it has to do. It has to clean up the roadsides. We have to give it some love for that. Um, so they, um, these birds don't get a lot of our attention. They're also really not truly raptors. So we tend to kind of ignore them. Some, some hawk watchers don't even count them uh, and just kind of neglect them overall. But vultures are amazing. And if you've ever seen uh, a group of them soaring together, they're quite graceful too. Um, down in the tropics, I mentioned Veracruz. One of the, the birds that they see the most of is turkey vultures coming through in groups of hundreds of thousands. And it is just an amazing spectacle to see that because of their graceful flight and rarely need to flap too. They have a strong dihedral, that V shape to the wings. They do a lot of rocking back and forth, teetering. They know how to play the wind and the thermals very well. And uh, they have big wings to flap and they don't wanna have to um, get, as, get more energy than they need to. It's, it's uh, hard work eating dead animals, but they have a, a really great sense of smell too, which is something most birds don't. Um, we see them migrating out in October, although we have plenty of vulture company throughout September as well. They're just local birds cruising around. And now with that, I think we are ready for some hawk watching and ready to find a summit near you. So uh, for some resources here, I'll leave this page up for um, as I answer some questions. How about does that work? I think that's the last slide. That's yeah, that's great. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. That was amazing. So much information and we have lots of great questions here. Um, I'm just going to start with the ones that came in first and we'll go through as many as we can. Um, so a question that Karen was wondering about is how far can they fly in a single day? So mm. any, any great question. That? And it, uh, it does depend on the bird themselves, but um, we think of uh, our broad winged hawk, which we probably know the most about or, or a lot about anyway. Um, as flying maybe 250 to 300 miles on a good day. Um, they might get enough of a tailwind to make that much distance. And um, it's also interesting to watch these uh, reports as we go down the flyway from day to day. You can see where there might be a noticeable individual bird or a rare bird that was, was in with a different, with a large group that was noticed at a hawk watch, maybe down in Connecticut, 200 miles away the next day. So we have some good data to support that as well, in addition to the birds that are returning data from transmitters, which are you know, giving us true est estimations of that. We know that peregrine falcons and others are super fast flyers too. So some of, some of these birds might be able to go quite a bit further over ocean because they're flying all night long, long too. So wow. um, you know, trans gulf flight in, in maybe a day or two. Amazing. Good question. That's a great question and amazing to think that they fly that many miles in a day. Um, pretty amazing. So here's a, just a really interesting question. When you showed that picture of all those hawks of the broad wings up in the kettle, um, Lida was wondering, how do you actually count them? Because there's like, yeah. like there's just a mess of them. They're boiling up. So how do you, <laughs> how does a hawk watcher count them? Well, it's not easy. I'll start with that. It's not easy. It takes experience and, and it takes a protocol really in order to know how to do it. So there is some methodology that we use. And um, generally though, we're just kind of winging it just like the birds are. And we're trying to uh, see them as they peel out of a kettle. So the, the act of peeling out is, has been coined as a hawk watch term when they're all swirling around in this mass called a kettle. Um, at some point, the birds start to bank and head for the next thermal of hot air. So at that point, they're flying generally to the south um, and they're streaming. Uh, they all have the same shape. They're all spaced out a little bit apart from each other. And at that point, we usually try to estimate them either by individual uh, numbers or sometimes by fives or tens if we have so many that we just can't do that much with. Sometimes there are multiple kettles in the air and only one or two observers to deal with those. Those are not ideal times for getting accurate counts, but it does happen sometimes, so we just do our best. 
so yeah, when we have to, we estimate, but a lot of the time it's um, just getting counts and, and coordinating with other volunteers on the Hawkwatch platform to, um, to maybe watch a certain group of birds and get a count and then communicate back and forth. So yeah, it can be, uh, it, it's a fun project to uh, be able to analyze that. Good question. And yeah, you'll have to give it a try for yourselves. Tagging onto that question, Janet was asking about yeah. competition in those big groups. Are they still looking for prey on their migration and are they competing with each other? What's the advantage of them flying all together? Yeah, great question. It was probably an evolution for um, catching the thermals. So when the broad-winged hawks leave, it's, it's really the one species that around here gathers up in these massive groups. Um, other species will do it in other or flyways too, but they are they are there because of the wind. Because the wind is um, the the thermals can lift them so high up that they can, you know, get the most bang for their buck. Really, as far as the distance they need to cover on a trip to South America, which might take them a month and a half or, or more. So they need to make days with distance because there are a lot of days where they can't make distance, like today with uh, with really you know only thermals and no real wind. Other than that. So there are many days where they're just hunkered down, waiting for weather to pass. And then if they get favorable conditions, they'll catch the kettles and go. So um, yeah, the advantage is, is they're not they're not competing on the wing a lot of the time. Um, sometimes though, they will have to find food when they land. Um, for a long time, we thought that broad-winged hawks didn't feed while they migrated, but they fly for a month and a half and they do indeed feed along the way to some extent. Um, we know the occipiters certainly do. The, the sharp shins are hunting along the wing and the merlins are hunting as they fly. And, and many of the others are also. But yeah, we see them together because they're there for the wind and the thermals. Great. Um, here's another question. Uh, what if you could suggest to somebody like, what's a good time to go hawk watching in, in terms of the day? Mm -hmm. um, or does it really vary on the weather? Yeah, I know we've we've looked at that over the years a little bit. Um, we, we we cover the whole day, and and the weather day to day can really do a lot to the hourly, um, you know, what we see hourly. Um, if the winds are strong, for example, the birds can be flying low all day long. Uh, but generally, I I would say there is a noticeable lift off in the morning a lot of the time. Uh, between the 10 and 11 hour um, and and usually maybe there might be a little bit of a lull in the midday and then it picks up again in the afternoon but it really depends on the species and the exact time of year within the window right now for broadwing talks though it, it could be any time of the day when the winds are right and the thermals are strong so yeah today right at around 10 we started seeing a whole bunch of raptors all at once and then 12 o'clock we had almost nothing. It's like the birds took a lunch break. <laughs> That's good. Everybody's got to take a lunch break. Um, so Elaine and I had a similar question, which had to do with the Harrier, which is my favorite raptor. Um, you, it, it mentioned in the video that you can't depend on the white rump patch that you see, that you often see on a Harrier. What other raptors would show a white rump patch? Hmm. Yeah, that the video did mention that others could in certain winds or the way they're holding their, their um, tails. But even a Cooper's hawk can show uh, a big white fluffy patch on the side of the bird, which isn't necessarily a rump patch, but if you catch a look at a side angle of the bird, you might see white right there, a big white fluffy patch of feathers that are um, prominently displayed. And um, goshawks will also show some white in the undertail that looks like it could be in the rump area. Um, bigger hawks though, let's see. Um, uh, well, the base of the tail is white and the um, for golden eagles and rough-legged hawks also show white at the base of their tail. So there are some that, that can be confused. So yeah, it's good to use many different clues in order to make the ID. To be a good raptor detective, you can't just use one clue. But if you had to, behavior would be that one clue. 
<laughs> That's great. Thanks, Bill. And this might be our last question for um, this evening. And I just want to say again, what a great job you've done um, giving us lots of information. And if anybody out in this group wants another opportunity for a primer, you can join us on September 15th um, for Hawk Watching for Families. And um, that will be done by Kim Snyder. Um, and she will be kind of reviewing some of the same things. So this is just the more you practice, right, Phil, the, the more you can put it into practice. Uh, but here's the last question. Um, and this is, from, yeah, this is from Dylan. Um, he's wondering about identifying raptors by their calls. And um, do, do you use it as a tool? Yeah, well, great appropriate question as, as we did today for uh, for a raptor that flew over that we wouldn't have otherwise seen if it weren't for the, the distinctive loud kick, 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 call of the Merlin. Um, the Merlin was dive bombing a, a raven today and we it was well beyond us by the time we, we noticed it and uh, just caught enough of a look at it. So yeah, you can identify raptors by their calls, although they're, they're usually pretty silent this time of the year. Um, you might hear some red-shouldered hawks, though, in migration, being pretty vocal. The broad wings have been calling all summer around our, us when they're nesting, but they're also very quiet right now. So, uh, so yeah, sometimes when they're angry, especially, they'll be calling. Thanks, Phil. That was great. And again, thanks, thanks to everybody who showed up today to learn about um, how to go hawk watching in your own area and, um, and hope you do it. If you get any great sightings and you want to share, you can always send Miles or me or Phil an email. We're always looking forward to hearing that. Any great pictures, you can send them to the Harris Center. We always have a photo of the month that we use in our um, Bobcat e-newsletter and sometimes on our website. So um, hopefully we'll hear from you and what you see. Thanks again. And Phil, thank you. Give you a standing O. Uh, thank you, Susan Miles, and everybody for, for watching. Go hawk watching. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.